we go. Right. Okay, we've got the recording going. So I want to give everybody a welcome to our presentation today. You're very welcome to be joining us here. Uh, we've got speaker lined up for you. This is Coaching Agile Journeys. Uh, it's number 14 for us that we've been doing. Isaac Garcia, I'm one of the co-hosts of this. Lori is also here. Heidi and Jeff might pop in now and then, but uh, we've got the primary uh, co-hosting responsibilities today. So if you're first time joining us here, um, we are a group of Agilists who are on a journey, and that's where the name comes from. And so we recognize that uh, it's more fun to go on a journey with people instead of going alone. So uh, we're a group that's committed to living out our Agile journey together and to live it out to the fullest. So at coachingagilejourneys.com is where you can find us. That's where you'll see information about uh, upcoming talks and as well as previous talks. If there's something that you hear today that you'll remember and go, ooh, I want to hear what that was again, in the future we'll get the recording posted there on coachingagilejourneys.com in a blog post. So you can come back and review it. We should also have the slides there once we're done. So uh, what we'll do today is we're going to get into our topic. Rick's going to be us here in just a second. And so before he does, just a couple of notes about how Zoom works. So instead of doing a webinar style where it's us talking and everyone just listening, we wanted to make sure that the question and answer time was back and forth and you could actually communicate. So what that means is I'm going to start us off by muting everybody, but inside the Zoom interface, you're very welcome to unmute yourself. You can turn on or turn off your camera up to you. If you have a question for Rick, you can shoot it there. If you're not comfortable saying it, you're more than welcome to put it in the chat. Both Lori and I will be monitoring the chat as we go up to the end of the talk. And then we will come back on and engage with Rick for the question and answers. And if nobody else has a question, if we have some, we might leave the discussion that way. So we're going to go through the content now and I'll introduce Rick. And uh, Rick, it is all yours. Thanks so much for being with us today. We'll Okay, thanks. Uh, let me uh, see about sharing my slides here. Um, Did the button disappear? <laughs> yeah, well, uh, I've broken something. Yeah, I want to, uh, I think I need to set this up properly here. We did all right with this when we uh, were, were practicing. <laughs> That's always the way it goes. So let me see what I can do with this. see something coming up there we go we've got you all right now let me see if i can do it at, are you seeing it as a slideshow now no i think we're seeing the uh the presenter view all right <laughs> Classic dual dual view thing. That's all right. We'll 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 just try it like this. How's that? Sounds good. Okay. So what I'm going to talk about is uh, principles for constructing quality software, and what I consider that to be a fundamental uh, approach to that. And I can't do this without some of my favorite quotes. So you'll have to bear with me on this. So this is from uh, Phil Crosby, and I uh, studied quality management at Crosby Quality College back in the 80s. So quality is free. It's not a gift, but it's free. What costs money are the unquality things, the actions that involve not doing jobs right the first time. Not grammatical, but true. And then there's a classic, uh, Harold F. Dodge, quoted by Deming, you can't inspect quality into a product. And my personal favorite from Steve McConnell, Code Complete 2, Trying to improve software quality by increasing the amount of testing is like trying to lose weight by weighing yourself more often. I've tried that, didn't work. So what do I mean by the basics? And first of all, I want to define quality. And I'm going to go back to Crosby again here. Quality is meeting the requirements and it's not exceeding the customer's expectations, which is something that I saw in a different 
uh, quality uh, management program that I frankly didn't think very much of. Um, <clears throat> why is that? Well, in the case of software development, it's particularly dangerous to take that approach because that sort of opens the door to feature creep or gold plating, whichever you want to call it. Quality improvement normally requires changing the process. And that means that fixing problems earlier is more effective and less costly than fixing them later. And to do that, you find the causes of defects and fix the causes in your process. If you fix defects without identifying and fixing the causes, that doesn't really improve your product quality. So I would say that setting higher standards helps drive better development practices. So there are two ways to get started with uh, an approach like this. If you look at classical quality management, I'm sorry, am I getting a question here? Yeah, um, if you're moving on your slide presentation, we're not seeing that, so. Um, oh, okay, hang on a second. Let me see if I can fix the, this, this basic, um, let's see. Are you seeing the slideshow now? No. Nope. All right. All right. Hang on a second. Let me see if I can if I can fix that in a different way. Let me go to the to the slides themselves. And there you go. You got it. Well, I didn't do anything different. <laughs> okay. is, is it just a delay um, oh yeah you you just um you just uh moved your your uh navigation um on the left yeah yeah we're on the quality is free it's not a gift slide yeah um hang on just let me stop sharing this for a minute here and see if i can do this differently uh, yeah no problem and well, you're doing that. Remind everybody if you have a question and you don't have a moment to break in. I was I was actually so glad Lori broke in. I was waiting for just a second to jump in to say that about the slides. If you have a question but you don't want to interrupt the flow, just throw it in the chat window, and that way we can keep it and we'll collect all those for the end. So. Uh, all right, let me let me try doing this differently here and see if I can share. Okay, let's try this. All right, you're seeing it as a more of a slideshow now, I hope? Yes, it's your first slide. Okay. Yep. Yeah. All right. There we go. Yes. All right. Now we're with you. All right, so um, let's get back to where I was here. So. Uh, I would say there are two ways to uh, get started. If you look at classical quality management, it sort of tells you to identify and fix process defects that might, in, in fact, be unique to the way you do things or your organization. Um, I'm not sure that's a good way to do this. And I think that I like Richard Hamming is the source of this quote. How do I obey Newton's rule? He said, if I've seen further than others, it's because I've stood on the shoulders of giants. These days we stand on each other's feet. I think that we should stand on the shoulders of giants. And in fact, you can actually see further if you just stand on the shoulders of ordinary sized people as well. So I would say if we want to profit from the work of pioneers in the field of software quality, we owe it to ourselves and to them to stand on their shoulders and not start from a clean sheet of paper, if you will. So here are your sort of standard phases of software development. Um, with apologies to agile approaches, but nevertheless, if you look at these, most people will concede that a, a good source of errors or a good way to introduce errors in the requirements definition phase, that's not what I'm talking about today. I'm talking about construction. I'm talking about the part where you're building software. So that's my focus. And what's wrong with software construction? Historically, I would say it's the right only exercise. If it doesn't break, nobody else reads it. I've had people disagree with me on this, but I've been at this for almost 47 years, and I think that it's largely true. That if you write software that works, pretty much unless you coerce it through your process, nobody else is gonna read it. 
also you have standards that don't exist or that are made up on the spot that are ad hoc. Testing is treated as a separate exercise. And of course you've got rework or patches to fix defects, otherwise known as bugs. There, aren't they cute? Features tend to take precedence over quality. That's the reason why I don't think that you should try to exceed your customer's expectations. And the definition of quality itself isn't rigorous enough. So standards and best practices aren't followed because they're not stated as requirements. Well, what's missing in software construction? If we built buildings this way, they might not stand up, or maybe we might not. But buildings aren't built this way. So here I just want to diverge a little bit because I take some of this inspiration from one of my brothers who's an architect. And I like to say that he had the last laugh on his professors who said that he would never make much of an architect because he wasn't much of a designer. Well, today he is arguably Connecticut's leading expert on the building of fire safety codes and he consults with other architects and with uh, contractors on how to build buildings properly. So this is a list which I'm not gonna go through of typical building code requirements. If you're curious, this comes from the New York State Building Code, which you can find online for free and read. That's what my brother uh, said to me when I asked him for a copy of the Connecticut Building Code that he and my other brother actually published at one point to thump on the podium when I spoke on the subject. He laughed at me and said, just look at it online. So, What's missing is a building code for software because there's a lack of external standards. Organizations create their own standards. There's no penalty for inadequate standards and best practices are the first thing to go on their cost and schedule pressure. So where do building codes come from? <clears throat> they don't come from a blank sheet of paper. There's a starting point, the International Code Council, local authorities then vet that, and they use independent standards organizations. And here is the building code of the New York State. I won't read the details of where they get it from, but they get it from various standards organizations. So here's a concrete example. <clears throat> I call it that because how do we send engineers into a warehouse with a tub of concrete? Is that how we decide how to build concrete buildings? And the simple answer is no. We use the standards from the American Concrete Institute with a few adaptations and changes. It amounts to just a few sentences actually in the New York State Building Code. So how do we apply this to software? We can start by not inventing our own standards. We can identify industry best practices. We can enforce them in a couple of different ways. One of them is at the requirements phase, and the other is in setting rules for how we develop software, and that's how we make sure that our software doesn't fall down. So how do we improve development practices? One way is uniform coding standards. And you can find references and tools and best practices for this sort of thing. Another is automated unit testing. Automated unit testing has a lot of benefits. And I've outlined some here, but I'll, I'll talk about it in more detail. But it affects your design for tests and, and different tools. And what I would suggest is an enterprise approach that you can take using these tools. Another is root cause analysis and classification. Now here I have sort of a bone to pick with the CMMI Institute, uh, who in their current standards for CMMI puts root cause uh, analysis at level five. Whereas I think that root cause analysis is sort of a, a basic practice that you need to do at all levels if you want to do continuous improvement. And code reuse. And code reuse, it depends a lot on where you get it from. Um, reliable sources are important. Um, Capers Jones says that code reuse can have the either best or worst possible return on investment depending on the quality of the software that you're reusing. So uniform coding standards. I'm most familiar myself with the Microsoft.NET framework. The second uh, uh, pra popular um, framework is Java. And in both of those cases, there are places you can get references for design guidelines and best practices. You can get tools and techniques to use. Uh, static code analysis. Uh, there are various tools that you can use and you should use. Uh, and the other is code review. And I say with audit because in the environment in which I work, sometimes you'll find that people claim to do code reviews and they either don't know how to do them or they uh, only do them on paper. 
And if you're going to do them, you need to actually do them if you want to get the benefit from it. So static analysis for the .NET uh, environment. Initially, it was uh, Microsoft FX Cop, which was a free tool. But now there is an equivalent version in Visual Studio, the development environment. Um, and FX Cop has been kind of deprecated. And there's actually another um, iteration that's coming that I was learning about at a conference I was at last week. But the idea is to uh, analyze the code. In this case, it's language independent for that environment. It's applied to compiled code, and it lets you apply best practices that are known for that environment. Um, code review. One of the benefits for code review is, uh, I think, is that the code uh, is looked at by the developer because you don't want to be embarrassed when you show your code to other people. And that can uncover defects and inspire changes right at the start. Also, uh, when other programmers review code, it sort of gets rid of my statement about write-only exercise because this is the best way to share ideas and improve techniques. And sometimes you, you, you discover better techniques when you look at other people's code. And sometimes you uh, uncover defects or poor techniques in your own code. So that lets you determine and fix the causes of defects. The customer audit idea is to provide assurance that it's actually being done. Automated unit testing. So this is a very important tool, I believe. Uh, it has an impact on the design. If you know that you're going to have to write automated unit tests, you actually write your code differently. You don't drill down four or five layers before you do any work. You try to make things more compact and follow more solid principles and so on. Um, it affects the design, and the, you know, I used to call a more extreme version, but I'm not so sure that it's really extreme anymore, is test-driven development, where you write the test first. One of the benefits that I see from that approach is that it prevents you from throwing in extra features for just a couple lines of code, because when you've uh, met the test, then you know you're done, and you go on to do something else. As far as tools and techniques, well, there are different ones for .NET and Java. Um, there were actually uh, tools. Uh, the, the first unit testing was actually uh, uh, developed for Smalltalk. It was called SUnit uh, in 1994. Uh, JUnit was based on it in 1999. And uh, NUnit and its uh, descendants for .NET uh, came after that. Uh, but they all follow the same kind of pattern, and sometimes they're referred to collectively as XUnit, although there is actually a test framework called XUnit. Um, now, the enterprise impact that I see from this is, first of all, if all the developers are using it, you have uniformity. And the other thing is that, in some ways, I've seen this as sort of a pipe dream of mine, but um, ideally, you'd like your test organization to be fluent enough in the use of this sort of tool so that instead of coming up with a complicated scenario that describes where a defect happens, that they could write a failing test and give it back to the developer. Um, sort of saves a lot of communication. Okay, so root cause analysis. I've already said why I think that this is not something that should be confined to CMMI 5, but the the way it basically works is that you find the cause, and there are different ways of approaching that. There is the um, Toyota uh, original method of five whys, which is not a real number. It's really just sort of to give you the idea. You keep asking why until you get the answer. Um, Kepner Trago problem analysis has another approach to that. IBM has a method, um, and they've pioneered a lot of things in software quality, defect causal analysis. The only reason I'm not a fan of that is because it tends to be very wordy. Um, and I'll get into why I think uh, there's a better way. The idea is to fix the cause and change the process and then fix the problem using the change process. But how do you preserve the knowledge? And this is where the idea of classification of root causes comes in. Uh, looking for patterns and be able to do metrics. and um, the approach that I happen to like for this is called the Beiser taxonomy. I think I have another slide on this one. So, Boris Beiser developed this, and he's um, he's retired these days, but he's uh, a well-known author in software testing. 
Uh, he's published, uh, I don't know, about half a dozen books on that. And I uh, talked to Professor Beiser about it because I was extracting this from one of his books and I wanted his permission. So I tracked him down. Uh, I found a couple of email addresses that didn't work and a phone number that did work. And his wife dragged him in from the backyard where he was doing something or other and said, she said that he would probably give me 15 minutes. Well, two and a half hours later, when I got off the phone with him, he had explained to me that uh, he developed this method based on the Dewey Decimal System. It's just a number, and it's very extensible, just like the Dewey Decimal System is, and that's the way he designed it. And uh, he told me that if I had been reading his book from the front instead of from the back, just to find what I wanted, uh, he, I would have found out that this is the only thing he's ever published that he put in the public domain. And there is a uh, slightly modified version, which has the advantage that I didn't have to type it because it's in a Word document that was modified by a Danish professor, Otto Winter, who added some extensions to it. And uh, uh, Dr. Beiser recommended uh, Dr. Winter's version of that. And I have seen some papers on the use of this uh, categorization that says you can, you can do it in about five minutes per bug. So I think it has a, a great deal of, um, of potential benefit in that you could then take the numerical results, put it in a database, and you could do uh, queries against it to find out where your weaknesses are. Um, the other methods that I've method, uh, mentioned are orthogonal defect classification and defect causal analysis. So these are the top level categories that Professor Beiser came up with. You can find that in his uh, software testing techniques book. All right, so software reuse. Now, once again, I've looked a little bit at this in .NET. There's a lot of published libraries that you can get at um, and reuse in your software that make it easier where you don't have to write things. Uh, there are similar, uh, there's similarly a lot of open source software and libraries available for Java in particular that you can, uh, you can get at. Uh, I do recommend that you examine any in particular open source software in terms of its quality, you know, compare it to your own standards. Does it come with uh, unit tests? Um, uh, obviously, is the licensing appropriate? Uh, can you run it through um, various static analysis tools and come up with less than horrifying results? Uh, you know, is, is the, uh, are the complexity numbers and the uh, defect numbers you come up with in line with what you'd like for your own software? Uh, I actually have a separate paper on the subject that talks about how to estimate the cost of free software, which one of my colleagues, and it's not original with him, but I like the way he put it, is that free software is like a free puppy. Um, so I'll leave it at that. Now, requirements can also be a key source of defects, and I do cite a study here um, in Denmark, and this is, again, you know, where uh, people like Otto Vintner and uh, another one of his colleagues are involved, where they've done some things with uh, prototype usability testing. Um, and what I mean by that is user interface uh, prototyping, even as simple as just drawing pictures on paper. And this is a very effective way to head off defects um, at the user interface level, which means at the level of what people are actually going to do with your software. And they got some pretty good results in terms of error reports and usability issues uh, and productivity when they did this, going from one <coughs> version of a product to another. So, so here's the uh, one of the keys. And this is a question that I was asked to answer <coughs> when I first proposed that we impose requirements on the program that I work in. Um, to do some of these things like static analysis and automated unit testing. And so what I did was I turned to a tool, a uh, software estimation tool. It happens to be the one that's used by uh, the sponsor for the work that I do, which is the Air Force. <clears throat> and so we looked at the cost and benefits of automated unit testing. What I found was that 
in, in trying to look for previous work, papers and that sort of thing, I found organizations either use automated unit testing or they don't, then people don't stop to compare or if they have done that, they don't want to tell anybody about it. So here's your basic cost problem when you're doing automated unit testing. If you want to test n lines of code, it takes more than n lines of code worth of automated unit test. And so if you put those numbers into your soft software uh, cost estimation tool, whether it's Kokomo 2 or in this case, what's now known as SEER for software, you're done because you've already doubled your cost. However, uh, I don't believe that that's the case. What you need to do is use a more complete model rather than lines of code to account for the cost benefit analysis of automated unit testing. So this tool at the time where we did this was known as SEER SEM. It's now known as SEER for software and it's a product of Galarath Incorporated. And what I did was to bring some credibility into the process, my co-author on the paper that's behind this is uh, Karen McRitchie, who is the Vice President of Development for Galarath. And so she did the uh, cost estimation piece and took into account something which I had not in my original uh, run with this, which was the learning curve. And bottom line up front, it still works. So there are a wide variety of factors that we can take into account here, like uh, staffing, tool use, testing, QA, and we get output of effort and duration and cost and expected defects. So how do we do this? We consider the cost of defects. There's legacy defects to be fixed, there's new defects to be fixed, and there's defects not yet fixed of both kinds. And we model the cost using various scenarios using this tool. And we reflected some added and modified code and we did some comparison with different development techniques cut out schedule and effort, probable undetected defects after the uh, what's called the formal qualification test uh, in my environment, or you could call it an acceptance test. So really just looking at the development phase, we're not looking at uh, cost savings or benefits that occur after that. Uh, so if you think about that, um, there's even more savings that come from uh, the maintenance phase of software when you have done this. So here are the examples that we used. The project had three major vendor, three major applications, a couple of vendor supplied applications and the criticality was classified as moderate. So we had a baseline with no automated unit test and nominal experience. We introduced automated unit testing, which increases the uh, automated tool use parameter and decreases the environment experience and increases volatility. These are parameters that go into the model. And then we increased automated unit test and added experience, and that increased the tool use parameter and eliminated the uh, experience of volatility changes. So then we got results out of that that were estimated schedule months and effort and defect potential and delivered products uh, sizes and so on. So this is the detail that uh, Karen McRitchie came up with with this. And I'm not gonna drill down into all of the numbers here, but what I wanna point out is that um, in all cases, we came out better. That is to say that if you do automated unit testing, and I will throw in my major caveat here, um, and, I'm, and I will quote directly from a software development plan from a major defense contractor who I won't name and shame, um, unit testing, the programmer writes special driver code and steps through it with a debugger. So that's what you have to not do. If you want this model to work, what you have to do is either test-driven development or worst case, side-by-side -side writing automated unit tests when you are first tempted to write special driver code and step through it with a debugger. Do that instead. If you have code that you have made work by the traditional manual unit testing mechanism, I will not try to argue that you don't add cost or schedule by writing automated unit tests. You must do it from the beginning. Just like if you're doing static analysis, you have to do it from the beginning. Anybody who has run static analysis tools after even a week of coding 
will tell you what the outcome of that is. And the outcome of that is that you um, see thousands and thousands of errors, some of which relate to following spelling conventions and things like that, which you would sort of have liked to have done, but now it's kind of getting to be too late. So don't do that. Use your tools from the beginning if you want to get the benefit of doing it. But in particular, what, you, what we'll see here is that when we uh, uh, introduce um, automated unit testing, we end up getting fewer defects, both um, initially and then much, uh, much more so when we add experience. So once you get over the learning curve, um, you, really, uh, you really make out better, but you actually don't do too bad even if you are doing it for the first time. So I would encourage people to start off, bite the bullet, do your best practices to begin with, and you will not regret it. Here's the cost model in terms of schedule months. And once again, you'll see that once you learn how to do this, you get better results in terms of cost and schedule as well. And you don't actually pay that big a price, even if you're um, doing the learning curve uh, on that first pass. So it's, uh, you know, yes, it's gonna cost you a little bit more and take a little bit more time that first time. But once you've overcome that, the payoff is pretty big. So how do we apply some of this in terms of other best practices? And here I like to rely on, on Capers Jones. And he and I have had a few go-arounds on the uh, issue, which I'll, I'll talk about when I get to his list here, about whether automated unit testing is really that much better than manual unit testing, but, but you do have to have unit testing. And if you look at, at, at uh, Capers book, Software Engineering Best Practices, he claims that if you combine certain methods, you can achieve cumulative defect removal efficiency levels in excess of 95% and as much as 99%. So here's what they are. Inspections, requirements, architecture, design, code, test cases, and of course, static analysis. And then testing defect removal. Now here's where, you know, I have, I think I may have actually convinced him over many conversations that unit testing should mean automated unit testing and not just unit testing. But this is, this is what comes from his uh, initial uh, assessment. Now, like uh, most of the databases that are used, for example, in software estimation tools, um, Capers uh, assessment of the effectiveness of different processes comes from his proprietary database of results and techniques. So um, I, will, uh, I will tend to agree with him on this because of his years of experience both at IBM and that as an independent, independent uh, contractor. So what should we do? What does all of this stuff mean? So if you develop software, it means that you should follow general best practices and add them for your technology. Formulate your own guidelines, but stand on the shoulders of giants. Don't make them up from scratch. Don't do what I saw working as a contractor once at a major pharmaceutical research company where they handed me a inch thick uh, folder of how to write C-sharp code at name of company. Don't do that. Enforce your guidelines through reviews, and if you contract for software development, look at the practices of the competitors and insist on accountability for best practices. In other words, trust but verify. You know, go ahead and choose who's going to do your work based on who tells you how they do it. But even in that case, drill down and ask for evidence that they actually do things that way. They're not just parroting back what they know you want to hear. If you acquire software for the government, that's a different topic. And I have a whole different presentation on that because there are different things you have to do. If you want, you can't just uh, go and, uh, and say, I like this contractor better than that contractor. There are formal requirements for how you do that. And I have a separate, uh, separate paper and presentation on that particular topic. 
So how do you incorporate best practices? You have to both have and require, if you're contracting, a software development plan. What are the processes and practices? What are the tools and techniques? How are you going to manage requirements? What are the reviews and tests that you're going to do? Referring back to Capers Jones list. How do you do configuration and release management? And are the, are the deliverables well defined? What's your software test plan? Development, QA, and acceptance testing. So to summarize, I would say that I believe the use of known best practices can improve the quality of software. You can get better results at the same time as lower costs. And if you want those benefits, you have to require best practices. So here I normally will take questions. And I, of course, have some selected references um, in this, which are, will be available in the, uh, in the version that you guys are going to publish. So questions. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Rick. Let's uh, anybody, you can unmute yourself if you want to ask a question directly. You can put it in the chat. Lori and I can navigate this. Yeah, I'm not sure I can see the chat. Okay, that's all right. We don't, we don't have any in there at the moment. Um, I've got a question. I'll go ahead and kick us off with one. So I, I noticed your list of tests there at the end, your, your inspections and your tests. Would you recommend... Um, I mean, do you see those happening like all at the same time or is that like a series of how you would run, run your tests? Well, there are different phases. If you, if you look at that, let me see if I can uh, go back to that. There. Yeah. The, the, oh, there we go. Yeah. Specifically yeah. that in the next set. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, some of these are obviously things that you do, during development, I mean the the subroutine tests and unit tests, and these are uh, those are developers' tests. Um, security tests; these are things. Uh, it, it depends on your environment. Um, uh, that you can be talking about active security tests if you're doing web applications, for example. Those are things that you might have uh, penetration tests and that sort of thing that are going on. Um, there are also static analysis tools that are specifically involved with looking for security holes. Now, the, the free tools do some of that. Uh, if you want, you know, kind of serious security testing, uh, some of those tools are, are fairly expensive. Uh, in the environment that I work in, uh, currently it's mandated to use HP Fortify. I think the license for that is in the vicinity of about $30,000. And there, there are other tools like that. And the price, prices are sort of in that range also. So it may depend on the uh, potential consequences, you might say, of uh, uh, security failures. But certainly um, there are commercial tools which uh, are focused on um, either dynamic or static analysis for security testing. And just like any other kind of, uh, uh, especially static analysis tools, you, you shouldn't wait till you're done developing before you use them. Um, you might be able to contract out um, or pay by the drink for the use of those tools, so you might not be using them all the time. Now, if you're using uh, integrated development environments that are able to um, use static analysis tools either as you write the code or uh, every time you build your code, you should be doing that. For one thing, uh, there is some overlap between the free static analysis tools and the security static analysis tools. If you make sure that you fix everything that, that the free static analysis tools highlight for you, you will have that much less to deal with when you uh, put a heavy duty tool against your code. Um, performance testing, well, you know, there's a saying that you can't, performance like security is one of the things you can't tack on afterwards. You can't fix that very easily afterwards. Um, on the other hand, you need to know what matters. Uh, you can't go around optimizing everything, every piece of code that you've written. Some of it will be important and some of it won't be important. So you need to be thinking about that from the beginning. 
usability testing. Well, this is something where in some cases it actually pays to have either either work directly with the users, um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, things like prototyping user interfaces, and anybody could do that. There are people who specialize in human factors engineering, and depending on, you know, who your audience is going to be and how many people are going to be using your program, it might very well pay to invest in specific human factors engineering uh, to design the way that your uh, system is going to work from the human point of view. Um, system testing is, is sometimes called integration testing. Uh, it, 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 that's where you actually do your sort of functional testing. And once again, there are tools that you can use to automate that. They're, they tend to be kind of specialized, but depending on you know how much um, change and and how, how long a lifetime you're going to have in your software, you either are going to be constantly running manual tests with scripts in order to do this level of testing, or you can automate it. And that's another, um, that's another kind of specialized programming area, actually, scripting of, uh, of system testing. And then acceptance or beta testing. I mean, this is where you actually go to your... A prospective user to either get approval or uh, to uh, see how you're doing you know, if you're talking about beta testing or if you're in an agile environment uh, this might be something which is actually sort of part of your uh, sprint that you're doing this all the time that you have uh, a product owner or user representative looking at your product since you are in theory at least going to have something that's running at every sprint, uh, it would definitely pay to have eyes on and hands on your product uh, at every uh, at every step of the way. Uh, so I think that's that's the best thing I can say there. Awesome, thank you. Good answer. Hey Rick, I have a question as well. Um, this is this is a very impressive amount of rigor, and you know we do a lot of this already in our in our agile uh, world. But have you actually applied this in um, Scrum? Uh, well, uh, some of it. I'm actually uh, uh, I'm actually working on a project in Scrum right now, and uh, I have managed to impose some of my views on the way that the team is working. And I'm happy to say that we ha we have reached about 83% code coverage on unit tests for the code that we're, we're writing, for example. Um, and we uh, do run static analysis. And because of the environment in which this is intended, we actually are running um, the HP Fortify tool and making sure that we have no critical errors that show up on the security scan as well. So, um, so yeah, uh, you can do this, and and it is it is being done. Um, you know, and, and in terms of performance, you know, we have uh, taken a, a lot of effort to make sure that everything that can run asynchronously is running asynchronously. And that took extra work, but we're still passing our tests. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, you 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 can you can do this. Um, you know, it, and actually, I think that uh, it's actually more prevalent, uh, and some some of these things are more prevalent in among agile practitioners than they are among waterfall practitioners in terms of uh, test driven development is is almost taken for granted in at least some agile uh, practice corners uh, you know what, what I, I, I the uh, the development manager who I know who has been doing automated unit testing the longest is a guy who I in another life I sat in the middle of his developers in 1999 and uh, I was doing something that was typical for me at the time which was developing uh, uh, sort of sample code for uh, other software developers who would be using 
the uh, underlying software that was being developed by this group. But I was sitting in the middle of the development team and uh, they had come up with, and I, and I quoted Dana in my article, so he's not anonymous. His name is Dana Coy, but he, uh, he had come up with something which, and the code was Java, and he was, came up with something they called a test harness. <clears throat> now, retrospectively, I sort of went back to Dana and I said, well, you know, that, that's when JUnit was developed, 1999. He said, yeah, well, they had theirs, we had ours, and they seemed to be sort of equivalent. So we stuck with ours. I said, well, that's great. So what are you doing today? And today was uh, uh, 2008. He said, well, before we uh, released a product, we run 10 or 15,000 automated unit tests. I said, well, can you, uh, can you compare how you did with the product with that approach and with and how you did with that without that approach? He said, well, uh, I can't because we've never done without it and we never will. And that's the sort of thing that I found uh, when I was trying to, that's why we ended up modeling the uh, impact of automated unit testing because I didn't find anyone who had any serious papers on that comparison. Uh, if they did it, they kept it to themselves. Uh, and that's why I characterize it as sort of haves and have nots in terms of those sorts of tools. <clears throat> and uh, to my knowledge, uh, and, and Dana's still there and after a succession of a succession of companies, probably up to about six or seven, that <clears throat> um, that have owned that particular uh, product, um, still doing it, to my knowledge, uh, because I believe that that's what he thinks is that um, we've never done without it, and we never will. So that that's kind of what you find is that uh, people who adopt the, these kinds of tools just sort of in, in, intuitively realized the benefit. Now I had to justify, I had to cost justify it to a Lieutenant Colonel as to why we would impose uh, some of these techniques on defense contractors that he in the, uh, as representative of the Air Force to the US government was gonna have to pay for. Um, on the other hand, Dana as a Vice President of Engineering could just say, no, that's the way we're gonna do it. You know, you don't wanna do it that way, you don't work here. And that's all. That's the way it is. So, <laughs> you know, um, that's kind of the spectrum of what you see. Uh, but yeah, you you can do this stuff, and I think it's actually in some ways uh, more suitable to uh, agile development and more, uh, um, might say, more simpatico with uh, agile development techniques than it is with traditional waterfall techniques, where you know people are off developing the code and. They don't know if it works or not, so everybody's in their corner doing their manual testing of stuff. And and yes, if you get to the end and you say, "Oh, by the way, you've got to deliver automated unit tests," and they or you've got to run and pass static analysis, you'll get people saying, "Well, here's the list of thousands of errors, and here's the extra cost and schedule for doing the automated unit test. Do you want to pay for it or not?" And the answer will be no. You know, so. Um, you have to do these things as part of your development or not at all is what it amounts to. And if you do it as part of your development, I contend that my initial, you know, from the hip, I went to quality college and I'm going to tell you that if you do it right the first time, you get better results and it costs you less. Um, that if you analyze that as we did, that you still get that answer. That if you do it right the first time, you get better results and it costs you less. So that's my story and I'm sticking to it. I like that story. Awesome. Does anyone else have a question? I'll pause for a second. If anyone else has a question they want to throw out there. Cool. Well, let's take the opportunity. I had another one. Um, you opened up with talking about standards and specifically for developers, which I thought was excellent. It's really, I think, looking at standards and bringing them in for developers to follow is key. I also thought back on my previous project, and while we kind of had standards, not as well as you had defined it, but we kind of had standards for the developers, we really didn't have a good understanding of automation around testing. And so we brought in somebody who at least said they had on their resume, you know, automated testing experience. And then they went to town 
building automated testing. And so reflecting on those two, are you aware of any standards that we could have found to help us standardize the way that we went about automated testing like we did the way we went about developing, if that makes sense? Are, are there any standards you're aware of for new, new automated tester shows up, hey, we want you to follow these kind of ideas? Well, um, not as such. What language were you working in? Uh, that one was... Uh, the guy was using Java. He was using Java. Yeah. So I think Selenium, he came in and said, I have this tool, Selenium, and off he went. And we're like, okay, that sounds great. But we didn't have the knowledge or, or anything and reference material to say we want it kind of to follow these. Show us, yeah. you know, we didn't have a checklist for him. Yeah. And I'm not familiar with Selenium. So I don't know whether that. Yeah, it, 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 it almost sounds like maybe that's a functional test tool. Um, yes, it wasn't a web. It wasn't a web interface. So he was building automated tests around. Um, once we released it, it would go in and it would work through each of the scenarios to make sure that um, things weren't broken on the web page. Okay, so that was really a automated functional test. Were you doing automated unit testing? Uh, no. Okay. So you weren't using J unit. You weren't using J unit, for example. Yeah. No. So, so that's, that's a different level and it's not a bad thing to be doing. That's, that's coming under the heading of what, uh, on, in, on Caper Jones list here, that would be a more system test. Um, and sometimes called functional testing. But, um, what I would say, uh, is a, is a best practice in, Unit testing is one of two things, and one may be better than the other, but I'm not totally convinced. One of them is to do test-driven development, where the developer writes tests, or you could have somebody else write them, but you then you're really more into pair programming. You, you need somebody who's not, you know, sort of a traditional QA tester who's used to following scripts and typing things and that sort of thing. Um, Either, either the same person who writes the code or some people like to, to prefer somebody else so that you don't you know, sort of get yourself wrapped around the axle you know, with the same assumptions in the unit test as you have in the uh, code under test. Um, but nevertheless, either writing tests that fail to meet the requirements or as you're writing the code, stop and write the test before you fire up the debugger. Um, I think either one actually works uh, as a uh, as a practical point of view. But then, from the point of view of the uh, uh, you know, sort of the uh, the organization or the, uh, the the work group that's doing the development, what you can do, I mean, continuous integration is obviously a, a good practice to be following. And one of the things that you can do is that you can require your unit tests to be uh, checked in along with the code and you can ref you can uh, refuse to check in code that does not include unit tests that have the required code coverage. You can refuse to check in code that doesn't pass stack analysis with whatever tool you're using. Um, you know, so that, that's a pretty good discipline that you can follow. You can have your build machine run the unit tests, flag anybody whose test fails, and, uh, and not, uh, not merge it into the main branch if you're, if you're using branching. Uh, there are some people who, who don't like to use branching uh, in their source control and want everybody to work off the main branch. But all the same, you, you almost need to enforce the discipline. Basically, programmers in general don't like to be told what to do or how to do it. Um, so you need to sort of accommodate that in a way that says, yeah, you have to do it this way if you're going to be part of the, of the project. You know, I know that if you're developing code at Microsoft, for example, you don't have a choice about writing automated unit tests. Um, it's just the way it is. Uh, if you want to contribute to certain open source projects, you have to follow that discipline as well. 
you know, actually, I actually was just meeting with some of the key players at Microsoft's open source project for uh, Microsoft.net, you know, and, and anybody can contribute, but it goes through their team before it gets merged in, you know, and it, it has to conform to the practices that they require. So they're getting lots of benefit from people contributing a code that in some cases, because it's code that they're particularly interested in, that may perform much better than the original. But it doesn't get merged in until it also passes the other requirements in terms of quality and, you know, and even following the same coding standards and so on. Because you have to, you know, you, it's beneficial to even follow the uh, requirements that your static analysis tool may lay on you as far as how to spell things because it's easier to maintain code that looks the same you know you don't you, you don't necessarily want to have your programmers all expressing their individuality in the way that they name and spell things you want to be able to pick up code from one person and give it to another one in the environment in which I work, you want to be able to pick up code from one company and give it to another one. So it's even more important that yes. you do that. So you know, awesome. if, if you want your code to live um, and not depend on, you know, some somebody put it at the, at the conference that I was just at, you know, how do you evaluate your code in terms of how many people have to get hit by a bus before you're, you, you fail? You know, um, if the number is one, then you're doing something wrong. Um, yep. And a lot of agile development teams like the idea that you switch people off on uh, different parts of the code on a regular basis. So if you're going to do that, then you really do need to have standards and do things the same way so that you don't have enormous learning curves between people. You don't have what I call the programmer's gag reflex when they pick up somebody else's code. You know, or your first reaction is, uh, this is all wrong. Uh, is it okay if I just rip it all up and start over? You know, well, you, you can't really afford to do that. Yeah. So you have to kind of prevent that programmer's gag reflex. Um, and the best way to do that is to have everybody's code look more or less the same. Yeah. Yeah. I've, heard, I've heard that one before from, from a developer arriving new on the project. About um, we've got about three minutes here, but I have one more question for you from the audience that I think would be a good one to wrap up on. Um, okay, which is what suggestions or advice would you give someone who has a large backlog that needs to be automated? A large what what do you mean by that? <laughs> my, my assumption is it's a lot of items, so they're behind in, in the we we've built this, we've built that, we've built this, we've built that, and now all of a sudden, okay, let's go put automation on it. Well, that there's a lot of things that need to have automation applied. So a low code coverage percentage, where, where do you start um, eating that elephant? Well, here's the problem. As I said before, the model that I came up with to justify why it doesn't cost any more to do that is based on you're having automated unit tests that you do in parallel with the coding. If you really want automated unit tests, but you've got all this code already written, if that's what you mean by the backlog, if you don't mean stuff that hasn't been written yet, um, you're in trouble. You know, it's going to cost you more. It's going to cost you those N plus 25% or 50% lines of code to write that stuff. And you, the only way you're going to be able to justify that is, is a way that I couldn't in my environment, which is by the maintenance cost savings that you will, that will accrue to you later. If what you're talking about is that you have a sprint backlog of stuff that hasn't been developed yet. Um, and your team has not yet learned how to use these tools. You have a decision to make, which is, I think, it will benefit you if you bite the bullet, especially if you have a lot of stuff that you haven't done yet, um, to overcome that learning curve and learn to use those tools because you will be happy about it later, especially if you're under schedule pressure and you have to refactor things or rewrite things. If you don't have automated unit tests and you get into a lot of refactoring or, or, or fixing things, um, you are likely to be introducing defects uh, 
every time you make a change, you run the risk of, uh, uh, or, or fix something in particular. Whenever you fix things, you run the risk of introducing other defects. And automated unit tests used as regression tests will help prevent that. They won't, you know, it's not a magic bullet. It won't absolutely prevent you from ever breaking one thing when you fix something else, but it will give you a much higher degree of confidence that you haven't. So I, I think I've tried to address the ambiguity in that question. Yeah, yeah, excellent. Well, thank you very much, Rick. I, I wanna say on behalf of myself and Lori and Jeff and Heidi who weren't able to be here, thank you so much for joining us and, and for sharing your thoughts. And um, we really do appreciate you taking the time to, to share this with us. It's been very, very helpful. Uh, you're more than welcome. Yeah, excellent. All right, and for everybody else, I'll just say that uh, we will have um, our, we'll be updating coachingagilejourneys.com with our next speaker. And you can head there for information on it and to register there for our next speaker and to keep up to date with the ones that we're showing. If you're looking for the recording or the deck that was shared today by Rick, we'll have those up on the blog in a few days, maybe a week or so. It depends on how long our turnaround time is. But uh, you can go there for any resources and any, any other information you need to connect with us. Thank you, everybody. Have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye for now. Bye. Bye, all.